Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Before we begin, I, I want to let you know about a new show from Curious Cast that I think you might really, really enjoy. It's called Russia Rising. Putin's Russia has been accused of using internet trolls and hackers and even assassins to influence the West. This new investigative podcast hopes to unravel this, this giant mystery with the help of those who know best. Russian trolls, hackers, Putin supporters, even a former Russian KGB agent. Join Europe Bureau Chief of Global News, Jeff Semple. He goes on a journey to unravel how Russia has gone from tenuous ally to a potential global threat. You can listen to Russia Rising for free at CuriousCast.ca or wherever you're enjoying the ongoing history of new music. Do it. Trust me, you'll love it. Not that long ago, a friend and I were sitting on a patio. He'd had a few gin and tonics and was about to enter, uh, let's call it the loud phase of the evening. You know what I can't stand, he burbled? Anti-vaxxers. Those people who won't vaccinate their kids or themselves. They're wrong. All those studies have been debunked. They're a threat to the species. If I ever run into Jenny McCarthy, so help me. Now, I had a couple of shots of Japanese whiskey in me, so it seemed like a good idea to jump in. Me? Creationists and other anti-science types. They say the Earth is only 6,000 years old? Man coexisted with the dinosaurs? That evolution is open to discussion? That's crazy! And it was at this point a guy at the next table chimed in. We'd been watching him do shots of Jaeger. I, I know you didn't ask me, but since you're ranting, you want to know what really grinds my gears? Second Amendment gun nuts, the kind that insisted some kind of God-given right to own an assault rifle with armor-piercing bullets. What's wrong with these people? For the next few minutes, we sat there stewing in our rage and indignation and self-righteousness. Then a waiter came over and said, see that table over there? They would like to know if you need them to get off your lawn. So yeah, chastened, I, I get it. But this exchange got me thinking about some of the other things that annoy me. I'm usually a pretty calm sort of guy, but like anyone, there are subjects that really, really bug me. And upon some not-so-sober reflection, it turns out that there are a bunch of things about music that really annoy me. At least ten things, in fact. Sit down. Let me tell you about them. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Hi again, I'm Alan Cross. We all have our pet peeves. Drivers who don't use their turn signals. People who use the word irregardless. And while we're at it, you don't unthaw something for dinner. You thought. Unthawing would mean freezing it. What else? Uh, bike couriers that think they own the road. Email with no subject line. Parents who let their kids run wild in the grocery store. High-end restaurants that charge for bread and tap water. You get the idea. But what about music? What are the things about music that drive you nuts? Now, I'm not talking about, oh, that artist really makes me crazy, or, oh, I hate, insert name of genre here, or even, oh, I can't stand hipsters. No, I'm, I'm talking about bigger picture stuff. Well, at least I think it's bigger picture stuff. I deal with music and artists and managers and the music industry and music technology every single day. And over the years, I've amassed a list of things that make me crazy. And I think the time has come to get all this stuff off my chest. Let's see if you agree with anything I have to say. Who knows? You may find guys complaining about music on the radio annoying, so you just might click me off. <laughs> just kidding. It's my show. I'm not going anywhere until I've had my say. We're going to start with something appropriate before we get into anything. These are the Butthole Surfers. This track is called... The Annoying Song, and you'll see why. From 1993, in an album entitled Independent Worm Saloon, that's the Butthole Surfers with The Annoying Song. By the way, that song was produced by John Paul Jones, the bass player for Led Zeppelin. Now, where was I? Uh, oh, right. Things about music that annoy me. 
First up is digital trickery that makes up for a lack of talent. We're going to divide this into two parts. First up is digital recording and editing. I once had a very long conversation with a big name producer about this, and he shall go nameless for reasons that will be obvious. But he was telling me he was sick of having to deal with young performers who knew that post-production can take care of any lack of talent. This producer came up the old school way with reels of magnetic recording tape and non-electronic editing, which means actually cutting the tape with a razor blade and stitching it back together with tape. Today, virtually everything is recorded digitally. Most studios use Pro Tools, which is pretty much the standard for recording software. It was first conceived in 1989 by a couple of nerds at the University of California at Berkeley. It went through a bunch of different incarnations and names until it was released as Pro Tools in 1991. If you've ever used GarageBand on a Mac or Audacity or Adobe Edition, those are the technological descendants of the first Pro Tools system, which could record and manipulate four separate tracks. And it only cost $6,000. I have GarageBand on my phone, and it's about 10,000 times more powerful than that first Pro Tools program, and it came on my phone for free. Pro Tools lets you see the waveforms of whatever you record. It allows you to cut and paste and tweak sounds in an infinite number of ways. If, for example, a singer botches a word during a take, you can often edit out just that one word or just that one line and drop in another one. If the drummer's beat lags in part of a song, you can fix that in Pro Tools by time compressing the rhythm track. If the bass player hits a bum note, no problem. It can be tuned into place. Pro Tools makes recording so much easier. In fact, this program, what you're listening to right now, is recorded on Pro Tools. But like I said earlier, it can also be used as compensation for a lack of talent. If you can fix it in the mix, it absolves you of being spot on during recording. You don't have to be as good as some of the people from the old analog days when you couldn't fix glaring mistakes with digital trickery. This has led to some unreal and unnatural recordings, which I will get back to in a few minutes. Now, don't get me wrong. Digital recording is fantastic. And like I said, this program is recorded and edited and mixed on Pro Tools. I have Pro Tools in my studio at home. I could not do half the work I do today without some kind of digital recording software. It is a godsend. But you can see why guys like Jack White and Lenny Kravitz often prefer to do things the old-fashioned way with reel-to-reel -reel tape, analog recording consoles, and take after take after take until they nail their parts. They also know that sometimes you need imperfections to add beauty. Now, let me give you an example. When The Clash went into the studio in the summer of 1979 to record what would become the London Calling album, producer Guy Stevens had all four guys warm up with a cover of an old blues song by American singer Vince Taylor. Just run through it while I get set up, he said. So the band started playing. But, unbeknownst to them, Stevens hit record on the tape machine. And when the band was finished the song, Stevens said, right, that's it, that's a take, next song. The Clash was bewildered. He said, we can't use that. It was sloppy. The tempo was all wrong. Listen to how we speed up through the song. Stephen said, all rock and roll speeds up. Next song. The Clash from London Calling and Brand New Cadillac. Did you notice how the band kept playing faster and faster throughout the song? In the era of Pro Tools, that would have never happened. But if you ask me, it makes the song, it adds energy to the song as it progresses. I love that. This brings me to my second annoyance, which is also blatant digital fakery. Auto-tune. Now, auto-tune isn't supposed to exist. It's an offshoot of the oil and gas industry. Let me explain. Back in the 1990s, a guy named Andy Hildebrand was working for Exxon. His job was to develop techniques for plumbing the depths of the earth to locate deposits of oil and gas. He came up with a way of interpreting seismic data, and it worked very well. But then he realized that this same technology could be used to detect, analyze, and modify the pitch of audio files. In other words, it could retune music on the fly, in real time. This means that if a singer is slightly off-key, 
a little flat, a little sharp. Auto-tune can detect that anomaly and straighten out that note long after the singer has left the building. A substandard performance can be made perfect. The result is recordings where singing performances are unnaturally perfect. This is especially prevalent in pop recordings. Not all these pop singers are singing all that well. They get a lot of help after the fact from electronics. And so many singers insist on auto-tune. You gotta make me 100% pitch perfect. And it's not just in the studio. Auto-tune can be used in a concert setting, making it sound like the person on stage is nailing every note perfectly. It's real-time pitch correction. It's that fast. And it's not just for singers. Auto-tune can be applied to any instrument, any sound. For example, there are guitar amplifiers with auto-tune built in, which means you can play a bad note and have it corrected before it comes out of the speaker. It's safe to say that almost every new song you hear today is, in some way, auto-tuned. It's like Photoshop for music. Perfect pitch, perfect tempo, perfect tune. Now, we can debate the pros and cons of auto-tune all we want. It's a safety net, it's just giving audiences what they paid for, and so on. But I've never been able to shake the sense that using this technology is a form of cheating. Letting a machine polish up your imperfect performance makes everything less human. This is why I wholly support the position taken by Death Cab for Cutie. They are 100% dead against the use of auto-tune. You gotta spend some time, love. You gotta spend some time with me. And I know that you'll find love. I will possess your heart. Death Cab for Cutie who will proclaim death to auto-tune at every available opportunity. Now, if we are to take Ben Gibbard and crew at their word, there is not a single bit of pitch correction in that song. That's the verbatim sound of a band working together in a studio uncorrected. And that's just the tweaking capabilities of auto-tune. Don't even get me started on stuff like this. That robotic effect? That's auto-tune, turned up all the way to absurd levels. So please, people, just, just say no to auto-tune. Here's the third thing about music that annoys me. iTunes. Not the music store. I love being able to buy virtually any song whenever I want, and I cannot imagine a world where this convenience did not exist. What I'm talking about here is iTunes, the software. When Steve Jobs got back to Apple, he wanted the company to go deep into the music space. So in 2000, the company bought a product called SoundJam, which was CD ripping and MP3 playback software. It was renamed iTunes and introduced on January 9th, 2001. And in the beginning, it was pretty simple and functional. Over the years, though, it has become bloated and dysfunctional and tasked with doing too many things. It's a store. It's an iPhone, iPad, iPod device manager. Syncing is often buggy and weird. Its library management is archaic. It sucks up memory. It's slow. Searching can be terrible. It has a hard time handling large libraries without seizing up or crashing. It doesn't support high-resolution audio files like FLAC. And it's awful on Windows machines. However, that being said, it's still better than most music and media and device management software suites out there. It's just that it could be so much better, you know? So Apple, in my advice, it's free. Break up iTunes into its constituent parts. At least separate syncing from music management or something. That, I don't know, just fix it. More whinging for me in just a moment. And I know I'm going to get into a fight on this next one. It's MP3s versus CDs versus vinyl. Which sounds better? Well, uh, thank you for coming back. I'm, I'm trying to get some stuff off my chest by detailing 10 things about music that really drive me crazy. I've been in so many fights with people who maintain that it is impossible for the human ear to discern the difference between the sonic quality of an MP3, that of a CD, and the sound that comes off a good vinyl record on a proper turntable. They are almost always engineers who say that my perceptions of which sounds better are all nothing but confirmation bias. It's impossible to tell the difference, they say, 
because MP3s employ the science of psychoacoustics. The algorithm shrinks the digital file by stripping out all the data that's masked by material in the foreground. It takes away the stuff you can't hear. If you think you hear a difference, it's all in your head. Yeah, well, thanks for the science lesson, nerds, but I've done blind tests. The same song has been played on the same audio system. I didn't know if the source was an MP3, a CD, or a vinyl record. And every time, every single time, I was able to identify which was which. Now, this does not mean I have super hearing. You just got to know what to listen for. When compared to an analog source like a vinyl record, MP3s have a shrillness, a dissonance on the high end. At the other, bass sounds unformed, a little mushy and indistinct. These are artifacts of the MP3's audio compression algorithm. Its inventors at the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany struggled with this problem for years. And here's a little known fact. To get MP3s to sound as good as they do, engineers used recordings of a hockey game. There was something about the sound of skates on ice and sticks on pucks and pucks on boards and the cheer of the crowd that brought out all the glitches in the early versions of the MP3 encoding software. They got pretty close, but not quite 100%. And hockey was something that allowed them to do it. Now, compact discs do sound better than MP3s, but this is still technology from the 1970s. Things haven't changed since then. Certain recordings will sound a bit harsh on the high end. Classical recordings with lots of strings can be shrill. And once somebody points it out to you, you will pretty much always hear it. A proper vinyl record still sounds the best because it offers the ear and the brain smooth, continuous sine waves. Now, this is important. Neuroscientists believe that when we hear an MP3, the brain somehow knows that some of the music has been stripped out. As it tries to fill in the gaps, there's a delay in the secretion of dopamine, the body's feel-good hormone. As a result, listening to an MP3 might not feel as good. You're just not getting the same amount of dopamine or as quickly if you listen to an analog recording with all the musical information intact. So, engineers, save your breath. I know what I hear. And I can tell when someone is playing me an MP3 over anything else. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee. And he fills it only halfway. And before I even argue, he is looking out the window at somebody coming in. That's Suzanne Vega with Tom's Diner, a song that she wrote in 1981 at Tom's Restaurant at 2880 Broadway in New York City. This, by the way, is exactly the same restaurant that we saw on Seinfeld all those years. Now, I played that song because it was used as a reference track when the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany was working on creating the MP3. It was very well suited for their experiments because, A, it was a pure a cappella recording, and B, it contained almost no reverb. The goal was to compress this digital audio file to one-tenth its size with no audible glitches. The engineers working on the project listened to that song tens of thousands of times on their way to perfecting their algorithm. And you have to admit, they ended up doing a very good job. Now, I love MP3s. They're very convenient. Wouldn't do without them. Just don't tell me that I can't hear the difference between one of them and a CD or vinyl record, because I can my next couple of bitches also have to do with audio quality. For a growing number of people, the sound they get out of a pair of cheap earbuds, or worse still, the speakers on their laptop, is good enough. That's all the fidelity they need. They don't see the point in seeking out full-frequency, high-fidelity sound. Now, if you grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you'll remember how much money you spent on stereo equipment speakers, amplifiers. It was this pursuit of perfect sound, big, tight bass, even accurate mid-range, bright, smooth highs. Maybe you spent thousands upon thousands of dollars over the years chasing awesome sound. That was a sickness for many guys, and it was almost always guys, and uh, I, I, I had it bad. 
We'd get together and argue over what was better, East Coast speakers, West Coast speakers, or those made in Britain. We lusted after exotic hand-built amps. We compared watts RMS, signal-to-noise ratios, wow and flutter measurements, frequency response ranges. And it wasn't just the stuff that we had in our house. We went berserk in the car, too. Louder, clearer, more accurate. It all had to happen. But sometime after the turn of the millennium, society shrunk away from pure, clear sound. And now there's this generation that just doesn't see the point. Or maybe they've never experienced music in all its glory. And I think that's sad. If you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, find a 17-year-old. Ask them about their favorite song. And then take them somewhere with a big two-track stereo system and play them those songs really, really loud. Then watch their eyes bug out. You will have done them an immeasurably large favor. Here is a record that sounds unbelievable off a CD, or better yet, 180-gram vinyl. Rage Against the Machine was already a powerful live act when they went into the studio to record their debut record with Canadian producer Garth Richardson. He set the band up in a big room and routed all their audio into a concert PA system. He then mic'd those speakers and told them to play. That's why the first Rage record sounds so live, because... Well, it was recorded that way. Just victims of the in-house drive-by. They say, don't you say how high. Yeah. Just victims of the in-house drive-by. They say, don't you say how high. Still one of the greatest debut records of all time. Rage Against the Machine from 1992. And man, does that record sound good on a big stereo. My next complaint is my last about audio quality, and it's a golden oldie about the loudness wars. Take a CD that was issued back in, uh, I'd say the late 1980s. Then find the exact same album on a CD that was issued in the last 10 years. Give both a very critical listen. Which one sounds better? Chances are you'll pick the older CD, which may seem kind of weird. Why should something a quarter century old or older sound better than something manufactured today? Compare the audio from the two CDs again. I'm going to bet that the new CD sounds louder than the old one. The volume control hasn't moved on the stereo, yet the new CD is definitely louder. And being louder isn't necessarily good. Your ears get bludgeoned with sound. There's no delicacy to the recording. The quiet bits seem louder than they should be, and the loud bits might even feel distorted. The result is a comparatively unsatisfactory listening experience. So what's going on? Well, it all has something to do with something that's been called the loudness wars. Over the last 20 years or so, record labels and even producers and managers and the bands themselves have insisted that things be this way. When an album is mastered, the part of the process when the finishing touches are added before the master recording is made from which all CDs will be manufactured, the final intrinsic loudness is set for everyone. The trend has become that to make the default loudness, the default force by which the music seems to come out of the speakers and headphones, to be as great as possible. The way you do that is through compression. Using various electronic means, you squeeze in as much musical data as you can. The result is really squished music. There's less difference between the naturally quiet bits and the naturally loud bits. We say that there is no dynamic range. Everything, even the bits that are supposed to be quiet, all sound loud, or at least louder. If you want to get technical about this, today's CDs can be up to 20 decibels louder than they were back in the 80s and 90s. This means we're not hearing the songs as they were recorded. All the subtleties and textures in the album are flattened out. And if there's even the tiniest bit of distortion, our ears hear it and our brains get tired. It's called listener fatigue. So why is this happening? Because there are people in the industry who believe that the louder the recording, the more it will stand out and the more successful it will be. Although I've never really seen one shred of evidence that makes this true. And with the rise of MP3s, which, as we've seen, squish music even more, and the widespread use of crappy earbuds, the effects of compression are even worse. In fact, because so many people listen to music as MP3s through crappy earbuds, 
the trend has been to make those files, like the kind you buy on iTunes, even louder. This means more distortion and more bad sound. Now, these loudness wars may not bother you, but they drive me crazy, which is why I find listening to the CDs made in the 80s much more satisfying than the ones made in the 21st century, from a sonic point of view anyway. One of the best examples, and thus one of the worst sounding albums to come out of the loudness wars, is Californication from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. There is so much compression used in the mastering that you can hear all kinds of clipping and distortion. There is almost zero dynamic range on this record. It is so bad that there is an unauthorized version of Californication circulating on the internet. It's called the Unmastered Edition. Oh, look what I found. Here's what I want you to listen for. Chad Smith's cymbals, the very subtle and very soft keyboard line. There's extra clarity in Flea's background vocals, the new separation in the bass notes, the openness of the chords being played by John Frusciante. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this on the radio, but oh, I hope you can. There's a big difference. The Red Hot Chili Peppers and the superior sounding, unmastered, unauthorized version of Californication from 1999. Like I said, it may have been hard to tell over the radio because, uh, well, radio puts additional compression on music, by the way, to make it louder. But here in the studio, it sounded glorious, far, far better than what we get off the straight, overcompressed CD. This is a program where I am venting 10 things about music that drives me nuts. I'll be quick with this next one. Cassettes. There has been some kind of misguided push to resurrect cassettes as a form of music storage and playback medium. I could only surmise that the people behind this push never had to deal with them when they were around. Pining for the days of the cassettes is only marginally less delusional than feeling nostalgic for 8-tracks. Unlike vinyl, another admittedly inconvenient sound storage medium, cassettes sound bad. Cassettes jam. And you can only make mixtapes in real time. Who has that kind of time? Cassettes degrade quickly over time as the glue holding the magnetic particles to the tape dries out. And once those magnetic particles are gone, so is all the music information. Forever. Irreparable. The hinges of the boxes cassettes come in always break. Cassettes invariably end up in the footwell of the car. Cassettes melt on the dashboard. Not that it matters, because as far as I know, there isn't a single automobile manufacturer that offers a factory cassette player anymore. Cassettes are an old, inferior technology that served us well in their day and served no purpose whatsoever. Please, let them go. Find another target for this misplaced romanticism. Moving on to another complaint. Fans who abandon a group just because they become popular and then blame the band as if this was some kind of personal betrayal. Virtually every musician wants their music, their art, to be heard by as many people as possible. And when the breaks finally go their way and they're recognized for their talents, a subset of early fans will blow them off because they're not their little secret treasure anymore. It's the opposite of bandwagonism. If you love an artist, have the commitment to stay with them as long as they're making good music. Next, Record Store Day Gougers. These are the people who line up early on Record Store Day or pay people to line up for them and then buy up all the limited edition stock created just for that day and then sell it all for inflated prices on eBay. Okay, I know, I know that shows entrepreneurship, but it still bugs me. So what's that? Uh, that's eight complaints. Okay, two more. I'm very, very tired of people who complain that streaming music companies like Spotify, RDO, Slacker, Deezer, and all the rest of them are ripping off artists by paying out so little money for the use of their music. These payouts are not the doing of the streamers. Uh, hold on, back up. We first need to recognize that streaming a song isn't the same as buying a download of that song. A stream is a one-time only listen. Buying a download gives you the right to listen to that song an infinite number of times for whatever price you paid. And you can also share that song with your friends. Ever since digital rights management was removed from music files, we've been able to exchange songs with really no issues. Streaming a song is almost equivalent to hearing it being played on the radio. 
When a radio station plays the song once, it can be heard by tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people at the same time. In exchange, the composer, the artist, and the owner of the copyright gets paid a fraction of a cent. At least in Canada. Uh, in the U.S., only the composer and the copyright holder gets paid, but that's a, another story. When a song is available for streaming, it can also be heard by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people. But not at the same time. One at a time. And for that, the composer, the artist, and the copyright holder gets paid a fraction of a cent, which is pretty much the same thing, right? And the streaming music services aren't just paying out some arbitrary sum, an amount that they just feel like paying. Uh Uh-uh. The fees they pay were negotiated with a bunch of people in the middle. Record labels, music publishers, and copyright boards. Those people then determine how much of those fees they pass on to the artist. Now remember, these people are supposed to have the best interest of the artist in mind, but the whole process is completely opaque. It's kind of like this. If you have a job and your employer deposits your check directly into the bank, one of these direct deposit things, then imagine the bank determining how much of that check you deserve. When you ask why you're not getting more, the bank says, well, we think that's just how much you deserve. And when you ask how they determine that, they won't tell you. Meanwhile, and make no mistake about this, the streaming music services are paying out billions in fees. 70% of what they bring in, they pay out. And what's more, under the current structure, there is no way a streaming music company can scale so that their expenses go down and their margins go up. As it stands, there is not a single standalone streaming music service that is not losing money. Not one. The deck is stacked against them, and it's stacked against the artist. You want somebody to yell at Tom York? Look at the people in the middle. I do not understand what it is. I don't know the full of holes. Check for holes. Blink your eyes. One more thing that annoys me, and I'm going to get it for this one. I cannot stand Nickelback haters. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not a fan of Nickelback. But I don't understand this irrational, global hatred for this group. Why have they become this universal punchline? The amount of vitriol that is thrown their way is far, far out of proportion. Are they that bad and awful? No. First, they sell plenty of albums, so somebody must like them. Second, hundreds of thousands have paid to see them in concert. And third, and this is probably the most important thing, they are an important part of the music industry ecosystem. The industry needs hit bands. Hit bands generate enough money to pay for all the signings that fail and for all the new acts that need to be nurtured and developed. During the good times, there was the rule of 30 that sort of went like this. If a label released 30 records... 25 would lose money, three or four would break even, and one or two would become massive enough to pay for all the others. And for a while, Nickelback was in that top percentile. When Nickelback was selling millions for Roadrunner Records, that money subsidized releases for a ton of metal bands like Opeth and Kill Switch Engage and Mastodon. When Billy Talent had a deal with Roadrunner in the U.S., where do you think some of that seed money came from? Uh Uh-huh, Nickelback record sales. Bottom line is that you don't have to like Nickelback, but you have to at least respect and understand what's being done with the profits they generate. And now, some Nickelback. No, wait, wait, I I can't play anything from them. That's because some radio stations who carry this show have a no Nickelback policy. So instead, here's a band that Nickelback profits helped establish and sustain when they made a run at breaking the U.S. market. It's Alexis on Fire. And they said, thank you, Nickelback. Okay, there. Thank you. I, I feel better. 
Thank you for letting me get all this stuff off my chest. I felt a bit weird about doing this because, you know, it's not nice to complain. But it's also not healthy to keep everything bottled up inside, right? So, to summarize, I'm going to leave it alone after this. Here are the 10 things about music that bug me. Digital trickery in the studio to cover up a lack of talent. Auto-tune. People who say you can't hear the difference between an MP3, a CD, and a vinyl record. People who don't care about good sound. The loudness wars. The silly cassette resurrection. People who bail on good bands just because they get popular. Jerks that buy up all the good Record Store Day merchandise and then sell it for inflated prices on eBay. Those who don't take the time to understand the truth behind the payouts of streaming music services. And the weird, irrational, pathological hatred some people display regarding Nickelback. If you want to fight me on any of that, I'm here. I can be reached at alan at alancross.ca, but just be warned that whatever you say, you're wrong. Still, you can try and convince me otherwise, but you will be. You will be wrong. My website is ajournalofmusicalthings.com, and I'm always available for trolling on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. And please do not blame Rob Johnston for any of this. He just does all the technical production and has to listen to my ranting and raving uh, and has done so for a couple of decades. Le- leave him out of it. Just, it's not his fault. This is, just let him go. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 